knowing God's purposes for our lives. Just this week I, I, I read something which is important for all of us. Uh, <coughs> intellect, intellect, one's intellect is different to the understanding or the discernment that God gives to us. So that uh, <coughs> we may have a professor with a very highly gifted intellect who doesn't know as much as you do because of what God has given to you by way of spiritual wisdom and discernment. I thought, now that is great to be reminded about that, about God at work giving us a wisdom and a discernment. The message today has to do with church members. What kind of member, church member, am I? And I'm using that term member very broadly. Uh, I'm not thinking particularly if you're a church member on, on the books here at this particular church, but I'm thinking of you as belonging to this congregation. You've identified with this congregation. You come and worship here together with the others that make up this congregation. So what kind of church member am I? We're different temperaments, of course, we have uh, different backgrounds, different education. We've got sp a different spiritual experience and maturity. But we are still part of this congregation. We've identified with this congregation. We belong to this congregation. We have a common, common factor, uh, a common bond, and that is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the third letter of John, uh, we have... Three members mentioned, Gaius or Gaius, Gaius, Diotrephes and Demetrius. And this morning I'd like to just consider two of them. And the first of which is Gaius, the beloved Gaius. Uh, I noticed in that translation uh, that Jean read out, it retains the beloved Gaius. But when we look at the other translations, it's uh, because they want to, of course, give some contemporary English. They move away from that lovely term, beloved Gaius, my dear friend Gaius, to my dear Gaius. So you can imagine or you can, um, you can understand John, the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel, is referring to the beloved Gaius. This is the kind of friendship, this is the kind of fellowship that we can enjoy within the congregation, within God's people, belonging to God's people. There is this bond, this feeling that we have to another person. My dear friend Gaius, or my beloved Gaius. He says it four times, my beloved Gaius. And so, what... What does the John say about Gaius? Well, we've got a, a threefold commendation. He, he's praising Gaius in three ways. Uh, he's giving a favourable mention. And the first of what? The first of these is in verse three, where he says, "Dear friend or beloved Gaius, I pray that you may enjoy good health, that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well." It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell me about your faithfulness to the truth. Faithfulness to the truth. So he is faithful to the truth. This is the, the truth of the gospel. This is the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Gaius is one who is faithful to Jesus Christ. He's commended about keeping true to Jesus and the message about Jesus Christ. He is a person who has a loyalty to Jesus Christ. There's a steadfastness of his devotion to Christ. When we're thinking about, when we're thinking about truth, well, well, of course we understand that there should be a sound doctrine 
about what we believe. And I, I want us just to consider something important that came to my heart. Be careful about being right. Be careful about being right. That is in matters of doctrine. Be careful about our attitude and how we are to apply what we believe is our right doctrine. Uh, Wilmer and I attended a Bible college. There, might have been, there must have been about 200 students. And we lived in residence. We were residential students living in this Bible college for two years. And uh, the students, uh, of course the males were in one section, females in another, and they had bought old mansions in that area uh, next to the lecture hall. And therefore there were four or five within a bedroom. We were together, uh, and that was for seven days a week, residential within this Bible college. I'm mentioning that because <clears throat> the Bible college, attending Bible college is like being putting a plant in a hothouse. <laughs> Young, fervent Bible students with all of our right doctrines, our ideas about right beliefs, and we certainly discovered in the interaction with all of these other students that we lived with so closely, we certainly discovered, well, I'm not so right. Uh, other viewpoints are to be considered and there are other scriptures to take into account. And so Jesus warned us about being right legalistically lacking grace when, when relating to others what we believe. This is what, uh, this is what he said. Um, to, you might remember he said this to the Pharisees, to the teachers of the law. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices. Now see how legalistic they were they measured out a tenth of their herbs, their spices, that was set aside for the Lord, mint, dill and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy and faithfulness. You should have practised the latter without neglecting, neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out the gnat whatever a gnat is, might be a kind of a knit or... <laughs> you strain out the gnat but swallow the camel. Of course, Jesus, he's got a sense of humour. He's exaggerating here. He's, he's their lack of spiritual integrity in straining out the gnat but swallowing the camel. Augustine, I think I've got these... When we're thinking about being right, it's important to think about, this is what Augustine said, in essentials, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. Let's have some tolerance with each other. In all things, let's have some grace amongst each other. If we have a difference of opinion, let there always be grace in all things unity. And then John Wesley, John Wesley, in one of his sermons, let us then trouble, let us, sorry, let us not then trouble and embroil ourselves and our neighbours with unprofitable disputations, but all agree to spread uttermost of our power the quiet and peaceable uh, gospel of Christ. The other commendation that Gaius got was he was walking in the truth. He was walking in the truth. It's reported to John, the apostle, how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in the truth. 
That is, living according to the principles and the teachings of the truth of the gospel. That one's life, ambitions, morals, values, priorities are shaped by the truth of the gospel. Walking, walking. When we consider walking, when we consider walking, we think of progress, don't we? A lot of you do some walking, don't you? There's a few here, I think, go walking each day or try to go walking each day. You see the benefit of it. Now, it suggests that you're progressing. You're going in a direction. It, it calls for a constancy and a consistency. And, of course, we're relating this... John is... Re relating this to Gaius's life in his faith in Christ. And I, was, I wonder if we're still walking. If, if you look at your life now, if, if you were to evaluate your life in your faith, are you still progressing? Are you, are you walking? Are you walking? Or have you stopped? Have you stopped? Have you sat down? Sorry? I said I started off running and I'm just slandering out. He started off running, but now he's, well, he's slowed down. As long as we're moving forward, as long as we're moving forward, progressing, being consistent in the faith. The third thing about Gaius, applying the truth, applying the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Gaius has a generous heart and an open home. Something to understand about the background of why John is mentioning this. In that age of the church, and, and the apostle John uh, is writing in his old age, his old age, so the church has grown and what has happened is that the, the, there's evangelists and itinerant preachers who are moving from community to community. That is the faithful community of what would be a church, a gathering of God's people. And the evangelist would come in with a message and would minister to them and then move on. And because in those days there weren't a lot of motels and uh, the inns, if that's what you would call them, they were unsavoury places as well as unsafe. And so these itinerant evangelists and preachers would depend upon the hospitality of Christians. <coughs> And so that's why God is, is being commended in this way. He is faithfully applying uh, his love to the people, to the, to the evangelists, by opening up his home. He's, he's being commended for his Christian hospitality. And throughout Scripture, particularly in the New Testament, you will see the virtue of hospitality is valued. Paul writes to the church in Rome, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Applying the truth. Yes. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all men. This is in reference to the, the church reporting back to John the love of Gaius being expressed in his hospitality and his open home. We've got the second person mentioned here in this letter, Diotrephes. Now Diotrephes is a completely different man and a completely different character and personality to Gaius. Here's a man who is opposing, opposing providing hospitality to these itinerant evangelists. 
and he's expelling church members because of when they do offer hospitality. What kind of person is this man? He's in the church, he's got authority and influence within the church. But he's causing a lot of disunity. Well, we'll find out about Diotrephes. There's a threefold condemnation. Firstly, we see his shameless pride. This is what the word of God says to him there in verse 9. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. Who loves to be first. But look at what the other uh, translations of the Bible say. Who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. Who likes to be their leader. And look at this last one from the King James. Who loves to have the preeminence among them and does not receive us. You see, when he hears about John and coming and probably these other evangelists visiting, he sees that as a threat to his position. He's protective of his own status and power. And this is exposes what kind of man he is. And so we have here He has a hunger for prestige. He's got a desire for power and his jealousy of his position. Now, I don't think you have to be at the top of the tree within the church life or the church family for this also to be a temptation for us. There can be just within our little spheres of influence some bad attitudes within the life of the church. We want a bit of status or power or control. We have to guard against these kind of attitudes that cause so much disharmony within the life of the church. Secondly, second thing about him, his slanderous gossip. It says here in the Bible that gossiping maliciously about us or from the good news the terrible things he says about us and the lies he tells. And then pratting against us with malicious words. Look, in in attempting to elevate himself in the local church and to guard his position and authority, this man opposes and attacks the other church leaders by gossip and lies. He begins a campaign of allegations against the others to demerit them. We have to guard against these sort of things within the life of the church. Does it happen? Does it happen within churches? Look, if you look at the history of different churches and some of you have been in those local churches where there has been disharmony, dissension and disunity. And thirdly, His scurrilous leadership. I had to look up the dictionary for that word, scurrilous. (laughs) I thought it was a good one. It means indecent and abusive. His scurrilous leadership. He refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. This is such an unchristian conduct especially from a church leader. He's absorbed with his own self-importance. And we can see he's obsessed with ambition, his self-ambition. He's driven by his own self-centeredness. Some of us have strong passions that need to be curbed, need to be rebuked. And the Holy Spirit will indeed rebuke us. He is is refining us and transforming us from these kind of attitudes which may have come from our past. Might have been something that's grown up within us. The malfunctions of our, our background. That kind of personality that we have that the Lord is working on so that we might not spoil our witness and the work that he has given to us. Jesus, of course, teaches us about 
leadership and about proper attitudes, so much so. Um, here in Matthew, uh, you might remember that the mother of Zebedee, the mother of Zebedee's sons, came to Jesus with her sons and said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at the right and the other at the left of your kingdom. And of course that stirred up the rest of the disciples as you can imagine. His mother coming along with her boys saying to Jesus, oh, give these boys a favourite place in the kingdom, will you? Well, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant. Yes, I bet they were. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great, become great among you, must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, we've heard Pastor John Gollan talk about servant leadership. He's emphasised that time and time again. The right attitude, the right way to relate to people is so important within the life of the church. Grace might abound. So Diotrephes, he's a kind of leader and look, these leaders can be so hard working. Uh, they hold the right doctrines. They are loyal to the body of the church but their work and witness is spoilt by their pride, their arrogance and their self-centeredness. And the result or the consequences of this is disharmony, disunity and in some cases a congregation is divided. Serious stuff. In conclusion, as we read John's letter, we're introduced to three of these church members. We've only looked at the two this morning. We have, a, have some, I suppose we're introduced to some insight about personalities within the life of the church. We've got, we've got Gaius, we've got Gaius who's an example for us. And we can imagine the personality and the kind of character of Gaius. And so he's a trusted person. But in contrast, what do we think of, of Diotrephes? He's, he's distrusted. On Gaius, he's an honest person. And on Diotrephes, I think he would be insincere. Gaius would be known to be a kind person. He opens up his home. He welcomes people. But what about Diotrephes? Self-centred man. Gaius would be accepting in his personality. Accepting different people which is so important within the life of the church. But, Diotrephes, he would be very selective. He would want those who would be in agreement with him, who would join his team, who would back him. Gaius, I think, would be a listener. We need listeners within the church body. Diotrephes, he's a complainer. He complains about others. He accuses them. He lies about them. Gaius, an encourager. But Diotrephes, he's self-absorbed with himself. Gaius, supportive. He's a caring person, so he supports the other, others. Diotrephes, he manipulates. He wants to control people. John is writing about these three members. When I thought about this, how can this apply to us? How, how, what, what meaning has this for us this morning? This third letter of John, written so many years ago. And I thought, if the pastor should write about me or you, how would he comment? Now there's some application, isn't it? If the pastor should write about you or write about me, what, what would he say about us? 
What characteristics do people see in me and in you, in the church or even outside of the church, the neighbours? What can we guard against in learning about Diotrephes? We need to guard against pride and control and power. It causes trouble within the life of the church. And another, and yet Gaius, he's an example for us. He's a challenge to us. A man who's faithful, faithful in the truth, walking in the truth, lovingly applying the truth. There, look, there's no simple formula to becoming a very valued, let's say, a good member of the church. There's no simple formula to that, is there? When we think about it, there's a complexity. A complexity about our own personal belief, our personal maturity whether we're growing and maturing in the faith, increasing in knowledge and wisdom and service. There's that, that complexity, but there's also the complexity of finding our role and place within this church family. What is our place? What is your place? What is your role? Do you feel as though you belong to this congregation? Would you like to serve within this congregation? So there's that complexity as well, relating to others, learning from others, serving one another. <coughs> and then let's not forget God's Spirit work in us. The Holy Spirit at work within the body of the church as well as the individual believer. You and me, we have God at work in us and through us as the body of Christ, here in this place, as a church family, the Holy Spirit is at work in us. In us and through us and individually. So within that complexity, God fashions us to be his people, to be the family of God, to belong to his church. And the people said, Amen.